Welcome back to the Underworld Podcast. I am your host, Danny Gold. And today we have a special interview with Josh Davis, who runs things over at Epic and has been a journalist that's traveled all over the world, reported in, in Iraq and Libya, you know, fun, fun stuff like that, that, that we love here. And uh, now runs Epic, which has, I mean, if you guys haven't seen Argo, they were, they were the, the brains behind Argo. They have done recently uh, Radical, which I think won Sundance, uh, Breaking with John Boyega, Little America, which was on Apple TV, The Big Cigar, which is coming out on Apple TV. So all sorts of uh, really interesting projects that have been adapted. And uh, now they have a new podcast that's just come out, uh, Varnum Town, which is completely up our alley and probably up your alley too. If you listen to this podcast, uh, you know, it's about cocaine and, and money and Pablo Escobar. And small town America, which is all things that we love, and the combination of all those things is going to be fantastic. So, Josh, thank you, uh, thank you so much for joining us here. Happy to be here, Danny. Yeah, I have a, I have a lot of questions. I've listened to the first two episodes that have have come out, and um, but like, let's just start off quickly with a sort of brief introduction, summary, sort of what the podcast uh, is about that that doesn't reveal, you know, too many surprises. Sure. Well. Uh, a few years ago, I got a call from a friend of mine, uh, Kyle McLaughlin, the star of Twin Peaks, and he had heard a rumor about a town in North Carolina that supposedly had done a deal with Pablo Escobar in the early 80s to become a major transshipment site. And this is a town, a major transshipment site for cooking. And this is a town of 300 people. And so I was like, this can't be true. Right. How, first of all, I had so many questions. How does a town of 300 people agree to do a deal with Pablo Escobar? Is it like, do they have a town meeting and everybody raises their hand? You know, and are there any dissenters? Uh, so at first I was skeptical. Uh, but then he had some sourcing. Kyle did a, a local in the area who confirmed the story. I did some record searches and found out that the DEA was, in fact, very active in the area at the time. And then the third thing that made it seem possible was that in the early 80s, uh, the DEA was cracking down on Southern Florida. And so Escobar and the cartel in general, the cartels were looking for new places, quieter places to bring in their cocaine. So maybe it was possible. And I said to Kyle, let's go to Varnum Town and find out. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not going to lie to you. Like, I was skeptical, too, at first when I saw the sort of like summary of what it was. You know, Pablo Escobar, the most famous drug lord, uh, kingpin, probably gangster almost of all time, right? And yeah. he, that story, his story has been plumbed so much, whether it's for journalism, documentaries, TV. It's hard to imagine that there was still a story out there that we didn't know. But, you know, like I said, I've listened to the first two episodes and it's, it's fascinating. And we, we did not know this. Like it is, uh, it is something else, you know, and you think about Varnum Town being small town. The reason it's called that is everyone pretty much has the same last name, which is just like, you know, Varnum. Yeah, it, it's classic. Like, why do you think, why do you think that this wasn't covered, that there wasn't something about this? Like, and were you surprised that there wasn't? I guess yes and no. I think the reason that it became a major transshipment site was because it was so isolated. It, it's very well hidden, this town. It's hard to get to. It's in, uh, it's on the coast of North Carolina, but it's in, in, inland a little bit just beyond the breakers, the, the break, I don't know what you call it, like the barrier island. And so it's inside a series of inlets, very twisty, turny, um, hard to get to by boat, hard to get to by road. And there was a, an airstrip. And so on the one hand, you had access via the airstrip. And then on the other hand, you could get through from the ocean into Varnum Town and, and offload a, a, a cargo ship. So you had both air and sea routes. The other element that, that we found that was interesting was there was a plane that was flying routes between Barranquilla, Colombia, and Varnum Town. And it was an old World War II era cargo plane, and uh, it was called a Lockheed Lodestar. And this plane, the maximum distance it could fly from Colombia was Varnum Town. So uh, 
that's another reason why Varnum Town kind of suggested itself, perhaps, to the narco traffickers in Colombia was that it was isolated and it was the furthest north they could get. Yeah, I mean, how do you how do you think that meeting between like you know a good American country boy went with Pablo and his people? I guess I guess Pablo was kind of like a good good Colombian country boy at first, right? But like, I I don't know if that that I, I assume you know you guys haven't covered it yet. I assume that meeting does happen. But uh, just picturing it, just, I don't know. I, I would love to see it the does, details on that. It does happen. It happens in episode seven. <laughs> okay, so something, <laughs> something to look forward to. Yes. And it is a very strange encounter. The description of how Escobar operates, um, the, the, the setting of the meeting is quite surreal. Uh, well, I'll say that, According to this Varnum Town resident, whose name is Dale Varnum, uh, according to Dale, Escobar keeps a collection of eyeballs in in clear glass jars. As like uh, his enemies' eyeballs, like random things he bought off eBay. What are we? What are we? What are we talking about here? The way Dale <laughs> phrases it, these are people who had seen too much. That's that's that is such a good. I mean, it's not, even, it's not a metaphor, right? It's just, it's just perfect. Like, it, that is great. I, uh, I did not know that about Pablo. Um, but yeah, Neither that's, a, that's uh, you know, between that and the hippos, you know, what, what can't this guy do when it comes to, to little things like that? And Dale, yeah. you know, I, I'm through the first two episodes. We've heard about Dale. We haven't met Dale yet. But, uh, but I'm excited to meet him. I assume, again, I, I don't want to give any spoilers away, but I'm assuming you, we meet Dale very soon as well. And he seems to be, quite the character for those guys who who haven't listened to the first two episodes yet you know he is the guy who basically arranges this and and like i said um you know carolina country boy who all of a sudden starts flying down to miami with copious amounts of money and wearing silk shirts and uh i mean you can't invent a character like that it has to be a real person that existed to me what i i one of my first reactions when kyle called me was oh i feel like i've heard this a little bit right like American made that movie with Tom Cruise, right? Barry, it was a true story of this pilot, Barry Seal. But that was kind of like um, Tom Cruise being heroic. Uh, in this case, Dale Varnum is from a town of 300 people and seems to have images in his mind of how, how to play the role of narco trafficker. He had seen Miami Vice, right? Miami Vice was big at that time in the 80s. Uh, and so he's, he's like running through the motions of being a narco trafficker, but he's really just a guy from a small town. Uh, and, and he's starting to bring back some of these Miami Vice elements into the small town. So for instance, he decides to bring a number of Playboy bunnies from Miami to Varnum Town and have them mow his lawn in their bunny outfits. I mean, that's just what you do when you get coke bunny. You know, it, 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 it's, yeah, perfect. It's very strange and surreal. And, um, and on the one hand, yes, it's serious. Uh, you're turning on a fire hose of, of money and cocaine into a small, tight-knit community. And that's going to that's gonna cause problems, inevitably. On the other hand, there was a period of time when it did, uh, it did good things for the community. You could argue that it did good things because the shrimping business, which the community had been relying on for forever, uh, had hit a slump at that point. There had been uh, uh, some bad seasons. So the community was hurting, and then all of a sudden, Dale Varnum shows up with with the cocaine money and and people are suddenly buying new shrimping boats and they're building houses and they're starting businesses and it's injecting a lot of cash into the community. So there were some in the community who were very, very supportive of it. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that, that I'm really interested to learn about going forward, right? It's not just like this cocaine smuggling story, Colombians, all that sort of stuff. It's this idea of this small town of a couple hundred people and what happens when that town just gets like insanely flush with cash? And I feel like, you know, that's not, that could have been, you know, I feel like there's an oil story somewhere about a small town like that and whatever else. I just assume the consequences of that are going to be uh, dramatic, interesting for all the right reasons. It's kind of like this perfect, it's perfect for a dark comedy, 
you know, if you want to go that route. Uh, or even, I'm, I'm sure dark, like darker winter's bone sort of, uh, gritty rural thing, but it's just it, these rural folk getting a ton of cocaine money. I mean, is, is that one of the elements that, that interested you about this story? Yeah. It, it's like, again, with, with storytelling that has happened around this type of story in the past, there's like one character. It's, uh, or two guys, like Crockett and Tubbs in Miami Vice, or in the case of American Made, it's, um, it's Barry Seal, or in the case of Narcos in the first season, it's all about Pablo Escobar. This is about a town. It's about the relationships between the people in the town. Uh, I think you've, you've, you said you listened to episode two. Episode two to me really gets at the heart of this because, uh, you have one guy basically who stands up and says, no, I'm, I'm not voting yes. I'm voting no. I think this is a bad idea. Yeah, I mean, that guy is, I am surprised that he's alive for you to interview. Uh, Roger, yeah. Roger, right? I think Roger's. Roger, Roger yeah. Morton. And he's yeah. not even from the town, really. He's an outsider. And Well, but, but when, you say, when he said he's an outsider, everybody says he's an outsider, but he's only, it's only like 100 miles away where he's from. I mean, look, I'm not from small town America. My assumption is that if you're 100 miles away, they still see you as like an outsider in a way, you know, a oh, tight sure. town like this. But the idea that he is starting to challenge, and I assume going to challenge more, not just, um, you know, the, the locals, but like the, the police department that's nearby, that's not doing anything that's in, on the take. And also, you know, the cartels and the smugglers and, and all that, not just the local smugglers, but the, the ones who are bringing it in. Uh, that strikes me as something that people who do that don't tend to live long, especially in the eighties. Roger. Well, he, I think it's, if I'm, I'm pretty sure in episode two, he starts to get threatened. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And he, in later episodes, uh, he's going to take it very, he's going to take it all the way to president Ronald Reagan. Yeah. You hint at that, I think at the end of, of episode two, but it's kind of like, uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm shocked that, like I said, he was alive for you two to interview, but you know, good on, good on him. Uh, yeah. you know, you mentioned getting a, a call from, from, from Kyle McLaughlin. Like how often are you getting story ideas from cult TV actors who just call you up and be like, let's, let's look into this, man. This is crazy. Yeah. Um, I guess more often than I thought I would. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Kyle is, Per, him and I, are, we're, we're good friends, and he has such a wonderful sensibility that dovetails with mine. He, in his work, he has dealt with very dark, creepy, weird themes and stuff, like the whole world of David Lynch. And yet he, Kyle himself, and I would even, even his characters are quite, like, wide-eyed and bright and optimistic. And... And I think I'm that way in, in, in many respects as well. And so the two of us going out into the world, we always have fun, even when we're exploring something that's dark. Um, because I think we have a similar approach. And, and I don't know what <laughs> I'm always interested to see how people react to us. Because like at one point in Varnum Town, we knocked on the door of a DE agent who really did not, doesn't like visitors. And then he's like, oh, Kyle McLaughlin is <laughs> at my door. Yeah. Uh, and, and then we had a, a wonderful conversation with the DEA agent. It's a, it's a good cheat code, man, to get those doors to open up, you know, bring a, bring a beloved TV actor there. How do you, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, when you first hear the story from Kyle, who, who hears it from, and, and again, I mean, everything about this is insane, an organic soap tycoon who had moved to, to the town. Like, how do you, yes. how do you start reporting this out? Well, I initially called the organic soap tycoon, Kyle and I did, and she's like, yeah, this, I, this is what I heard. Uh, this is what people in town, it, it's common knowledge um, in the town that there was this deal with Pablo Escobar, that Dale Varnum had done this deal. Uh, and yeah, and so I'm, I'm, I'm a reporter, so I did my best to fact check it from afar. But eventually, you kind of have to go there and try to interview people, particularly because this hadn't, this wasn't reported in the news, so there you had to do original reporting. And are there any things that, uh, you know, any any initial obstacles um, 
anything that really threw you for a uh, left turn where at one point you were like, I don't know if this, it's worth following up on this or were you right away just like gung ho, I'm going to give this everything I have. And, and it was just like, you know, the diagonal line, str- like basically ramping up. Um, no, I think I was gung ho uh, pretty, pretty much from, from the start. Uh, I really wanted to get out there. And so part of it was just like scheduling, getting my schedule to sync up with Kyle's. And I was making a movie in Mexico at the time. And he was in Australia doing the Tiger King adaptation on uh, on Hulu. So I had to wait for him to come back and I had to get back to the US. So that, that was the obstacle was just timing. And then in terms of, of poking around this this small town, you know, are there, were people pretty open and, and, and willing to talk? I mean, right away, you guys start off with one of the local smugglers who's like, yeah, let's, let's chat about it. Yeah. yeah, I was surprised this guy lefty, uh, or that's his, that's the nickname that he goes by. Uh, yeah, everybody seemed pretty open, surprisingly open. Uh, it, partly it's maybe because it happened in the 80s, so it was a long time ago. And it's also, I think, partly because of the way it all went down in the end. There was some very, there was a surprising end to the story. Uh, and that your listeners will have to, will have to ride along with for a while uh, to, to, to really get into and, and understand why the town might be so okay with talking about it now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't. It's revealed in episode two, but there's someone like who turns state's evidence and all that, which I, I found very surprising. I don't, you know, I don't want to, it's weird. Like it's pretty early on. I don't want to give any spoilers away, but that was a surprising turn. And I'm looking forward to see how that plays out and what happens there. But, um, yeah, yeah I mean, ugh, it's hard. I want to talk about that, but I don't want to give too much away. Like, what do you, what did you make of that, that turn of events? I, usually when somebody turns state's witness, at the least, they would be exiled from the community, right? At the very least. Usually, you would, you, you would expect something more. Uh, in this case, that did not happen. Everybody who was there, not everybody, but most of the people who were there in the 80s are still there, and they're still neighbors, and they're still, like, going to shrimp fries together. Did you get to partake, so, did you get to partake in any shrimp fries? Yeah, I went, I, we had a shrimp fry, yeah. Out on the water, right on the Varnum Town docks. Yeah. Are there any remnants of that that '80s money around? Like, do you do you see like a '80s speedboat yeah. somewhere, like with a with a tarp over it, or like a 1987 Mercedes that's been kept in pristine condition somewhere in small? There's uh, Dale Varnum, the guy who purportedly did the deal with Escobar, built a massive compound, walled compound, and that walled compound is still there, and that's in fact where we went to go meet Dale Varnum. He still lives there. It's not like abandoned or anything like that. Oh, nope. still lives there. But paying all cash, like paid off that mortgage, something along those lines. It's uh, it's quite a extraordinary sight. This this compound because, uh, I mean, for instance, at the uh, at the front, there's a a giant bus, like an old, I would say maybe 1980s era municipal bus. But on the on the desk uh, on the side of it, it says the Crackhead Express. So he, he's not hiding the story. He's uh, and, and by the way, the the there's a a giant uh, plastic shark leaping out of the front the roof of the bus. He's like cut a, a uh, he's cut a uh, a skylight uh, on the bus, and so the shark's jumping out, and in the mouth of the shark is a is a, a mannequin of a woman. Uh, it's it's quite bizarre, and there's toilets everywhere. In the all over the front of the of the compound, there's just toilets sitting on the ground, or toilets sitting on wooden stumps. As like a modern art piece thing, or just like he just collected old toilets, or, or more like you know broken down cars in the front yard sort of vibe. Like what are we what are we talking about here? It's very specific. It's toilets. <laughs> And the toilets, many of the toilets have hand-painted signs on them. That yeah. instructionals? Like, what do we, what do we... No, no, they're like inspirational quotes. 
<laughs> he sounds like I'm, I'm excited to meet him. I feel like he's going to have, he's going to be one of those guys who's just like a quote a minute that, uh, you know, tough to edit down interviews you do with him because everything he says is going to be incredible. That's my, my guess, yeah. I would say. It's true. It's true. He, um, he is a, a very unique character. Um, and yeah, I mean, the way he talks is, he talks about dancing with the devil. Yeah, I mean, he does seem like the kind of guy who learned about everything from TV shows in the 80s, you know? Yeah. But he lived that life, so so credit to him. Uh, I want to switch up for a second here because I think it's something that, that, you know, our listeners are big into journalism backstories and things of that nature. And just kind of talk to you about uh, what Epic is for people who, who don't know. Because I think, you know, um, it, it's just a, like a very smart thing to have done 10, 11 years ago to realize the nature of where the media industry was going, especially journalism and this idea of, and I assume this was the idea of like, you know, generating stuff that could be turned into really great IP, turned into like brilliant TV shows and movies and things like that. And you seem to have figured that out, I think before 99% of the rest of the industry, which is still trying to catch up and figure that stuff out now. So kind of like, where did that idea come from and how did you get started on that? Well, it started just out of necessity. Uh, so in the aughts, towards the end of the aughts, um, you could start to see the impact of digital media on print media. So you have in print, you have the high value ads that cost tens of thousands of dollars for a full page ad in Vanity Fair or, or Wired or whatever. Uh, but then in digital media, all of that goes to banner ads which are pennies, right? Or fractions of pennies. And I could see that that was happening, that, that ad rates, were the, the, the ad business was collapsing for magazines. And certainly also for newspapers, the classifieds were getting eviscerated by Craigslist. So those business models were not functioning, which meant that for people like me, uh, who like to go out into the world and investigate stories, you weren't going to be able to have those expense accounts. You weren't going to get that per word rate that allowed you to do it or, or those contributing editorships. Um, and at the same time, I could see that the stories that I was publishing were getting optioned and adapted into film and TV. And that was a different revenue stream. Uh, and it was a sizable revenue stream. And so it didn't like it doesn't take a genius to just look at your bank account and say, I'm making three times as much money in the afterlife of the story than I am from the story itself. And at the same time, the, all the all the trend signs are saying that the story itself, business models, the advertising, the subscription is plummeting. So why don't we start a business? This is me and the uh, other Josh, Josh Behrman. Uh, why don't we start a business where we kind of admit defeat in publishing or accept defeat that that the, those two, you know, decades old business models of subscription and, and advertising are broken. We'll publish stories for free. We'll give them away. Uh, and we'll survive on the afterlife of the story uh, as it gets adapted and use that money to finance the investigations. That was the concept, and we started in 2013. This is, a, this is our, our, our 10th anniversary, or we were just past our 10th anniversary, and it worked, basically. It worked. Uh, we've been able to continue to publish investigative journal, journalism, very ambitious, long-form narrative nonfiction, which is a, a very specific art form that I feel is under threat, and, and we want to keep it alive. It, it, for ourselves, right? It's it, this is what I love to do. It's the art form that I like to practice. Um, but also for the world, it, it matters to me. There is still like a tremendous amount of risk there. I feel like that 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 people might not recognize in terms of just the investments of your time. You know, you're chasing these stories that might not pan out. You know, and then you're left with nothing because it's your own money that you're spending. I mean, how do yeah. you how do you decide? which stories, because I'm sure you're, you know, constantly having ideas, constantly having things you want to chase. How do you really decide which ones are the ones that you're going to keep 
investing time and energy into to put together? And then like, have you had like, I mean, I imagine you're not batting a hundred percent. Are there some that you've chased that just have not panned out over the past couple of years? For sure. I mean, I would say even we will publish a story, other Josh and I, that, that we love. And it's Im- almost impossible to predict Hollywood. Uh, so there is a sense like, oh, this story, obviously Hollywood's going to love this story. It's not, I've been doing this for a long time now, and it's not obvious. And it's always changing, almost week to week. Like Hollywood will say, we want World War II movies. And then like two weeks later, we don't want World War II movies. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So w- the way we operate is we just go with our the things that are interesting to us. So for instance, uh, I mean, I'm just picking a random one. There is a story that I found about this race car driver in the 50s and 60s named Denise McCluggage, uh, who went on to win a, a major major race, the, the 12 hours of Sebring and how she won it. The, the race itself was very dramatic. Her life is very dramatic. Uh, but, and so we, uh, Amy Wallace wrote that story. Great, great writer, did a beautiful job of writing it. We published it in, uh, we took it to sports illustrated and co-published with them. This is a number of years ago before the debacle of sports illustrated now. Um, uh, and, and to me, I love it. And, uh, and yet Hollywood was like, we don't want to do a story about a woman race car driver in the 1960s. Um, so that, but, but that's the type of thing that we continue to try to develop and, and adapt. And it looks like we're finally making progress. We've got a, uh, a great team together now. Uh, but this has been years and years since we, since I first found the story, since we we de- we we published it as an article, and now working on an adaptation into film, it's probably been what five years, uh, and we've made no money on that, zero. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a rough industry, man. Even even when you figure out the uh, the sort of way to to do it, like you guys are doing it, it's still a lot of risk, a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of energy, and you're still at the whim of of. Hollywood executives who sometimes might not have the best grasp of what a good story is. Yeah. I mean, the business Hollywood is very scared right now. It's in turmoil. I I guess I feel there are plenty of businesses you could go into and make more money and, and make reliable money and steady money. And, and that's, listen, uh, I, I, I see the value there. Uh, I'm, I'm accepting the the lower, the, the harder path, the riskier path, um, the lumpier paychecks, uh, because I I'm passionate about this, and if, if I can keep doing it, I'll keep doing it. And so far, we've been we've been lucky enough to to be able to keep doing it. And you mentioned um, you mentioned the the movie you were filming in in Mexico, and you talk about it a little bit. I think at the end of episode one, as like a, a bonus thing, uh, can you briefly go into that and 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 what uh, what's happening there? Yeah, so that's a story that I wrote about uh, the smartest math student in Mexico, who turns out was a at the time a twelve year old girl who lived beside a garbage dump on the border on the U S Mexico border. And it's the, it's a story about her and the, and the teacher who discovered her. And uh, I brought that to uh, Ben O'Dell and Eugenio Derbez, who uh, Eugenio is arguably Latin America's biggest movie star, biggest star. Uh, and and he was he's a comedian. Everybody knows him as a comedian. Uh, but he responded to the to to the story and and in particular he wanted to play the role of this teacher and it it was a moment it was an interesting moment because you remember when Robin Williams went from being a comedic actor to Dead Poets Society yeah and you're just like whoa this guy really has the chops Ahenio did that in this film in this adaptation he's a comedic actor who played a school teacher and had the, his kind of Dead Poets Society moment 
The film was the opening night film last year at Sundance and went on to win the uh, the Audience Award for Best Film at the festival. Not a bad, not a bad first outing right there. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I think it's out this week on VIX, streaming on VIX, V-I-X. Uh, it was in theaters. It was in theaters at the end of last year, and now it's streaming. Uh, in terms of of you know, speaking of plugs, where else can people find your work? Where can they find the podcast? Uh, you know, anything else you want to share or get people to go to? Well, if you if for anybody who's interested in true stories, there's epicmagazine.com. You'll find the whole list of epic stories over the last ten years. I should actually know how many stories we published. I don't. I've never counted, but dozens, uh, dozens of of you know, blood, sweat, and tears in each story. Uh, and then, yeah, uh, Radicals out on on streaming on VIX and Breaking with John Boyega also out there streaming across. I think it was on Showtime. It's on Showtime and then Amazon. Uh, and then soon we have Big Cigar coming out on Apple TV, which is about a, a very strange story about a friendship between Huey Newton, one of the leaders of the Black Panthers, and a Hollywood producer named Bert Schneider, who did Easy Rider. Um, and, and at some point, Huey got into trouble with the police in Oakland and asked Bert to smuggle him to Cuba, which Bert proceeded to assemble a, a, a crack team of Hollywood, uh, Hollywood experts, uh, and, and they collectively smuggled, smuggled Huey to Cuba. Oh wow! I had no idea. I mean, that's uh, I know he got he got smuggled out, right? Didn't he end up in Morocco, or am I confusing him with uh, a different that's black a different, man, different black man? Different, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, that sounds fantastic. Yeah, so that's coming out with Andre Holland playing Huey. Oh, nice! And then Varnum Town. What were two episodes in? You said eight episodes. Where uh, Spotify, iTunes, everything. Wherever you get your podcasts. Cool, um, Josh. Thank you so much for your time and and for. You know, giving us the the rundown of everything here. Anything else you wanna you wanna share? You wanna get across? Well, just thanks for having me. It's fun. I love talking about journalism. It's we're in such a bind. Uh, the the industry is in such turmoil, and and yet what we do, what all of us collectively do in the world of journalism, is has to happen. It has to exist. And I guess what I just keep coming back to is people want it. Like the, the, the audience is there, the market is there. And we, we just have to unfortunately become a little bit more entrepreneurial as journalists. It's not, it's not what we want to do, but we have to do in order to, to find that market in, in new ways. We're trying, man. Patreon.com slash the world podcast. Let's make a, make it happen. Josh Davis. Thanks so much for your time. Varnum town. Go listen to it. Uh, like I said, first two episodes are great. You're going to want to keep listening. Thank you.